Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Dietrich, Associate Director of Membership, and I'd like to welcome you to the Making of a Longwood Christmas 2023. This event will be recorded and the video will be emailed to all attendees. It is my great pleasure to introduce our presenter, Jim Sutton, Associate Director of Display Design. Since 20, uh, 2000, 2007, Jim has been the aesthetic gatekeeper of Longwood, responsible for, for conceiving, designing, and implementing Longwood's renowned conservatory displays that elevate the art of horticulture. Jim will take you behind the scenes to reveal how Longwood creates its world-renowned Christmas displays, get a glimpse into the inspiration, planning, and creation of this jaw-dropping seasonal show that is the favorite of the young and the young at heart. At the end of the presentation, Jim can answer your questions about a Longwood Christmas. You may submit your questions through the Q&A function. Jim, thank you so much for being with us today to share all of the details of a Longwood Christmas 2023. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you, Melissa. So I'm very happy to be with you today and I'm gonna share a very retro Christmas. So we started planning this over a year ago and it always starts with inspirational pictures and a storyboard. So this is to get all the project leaders sort of thinking about what a retro Christmas would look like. So I like to say it's always Christmas. Um, even though the Christmas season is relatively short, it takes planning throughout the year to bring it to life and it takes many, many hands. So we couldn't do what we do without all the volunteers that help and all of the very talented staff. And it's also a time for people that don't get to be that creative in their regular jobs to express their creativity. So I'm always mining the staff and looking for new creative talent. So it always starts off in the visitor center. I want people to get the feel of the season right when they walk in the visitor center. And we manage all of this with a PowerPoint that we start a year ahead of time, trying to get the concepts down. So the trees here are actually painted pink. And I know it doesn't show that in the picture very well, but they do have a pink tinge to them and they have these mint green ornaments. Um, a lot of times I will set a color palette, but for this year, with it being a very retro theme, we did not have a set color palette. So we used all the colors imaginable. So when you step into the visitor center, you're gonna be greeted by four beautiful murals through the airlocks and as you enter the garden. Um, as I mentioned, it's finding out the talents of the staff. So the project leader said, um, I'd like to paint some murals. And I said, well, that's great. Do you know how to paint? And on the far left, that sample of the poinsettia is what she did as a rendering to show me that yes, she does know how to paint. So without any formal training, she made these very, very large, beautiful um, murals for the arches. And I think they really helped set the tone. It, outside these conservatories, same thing. We wanted bright and shiny to greet you into the spaces. Here's a fun thing. In the East Entry Pavilion, the wreath, that, there's two wreaths in there. They're made out of what are called um, putz houses. And it's this German style house where they make small houses and they decorate them, make them look like a little village. So we did two large wreaths of that. So when the project leader showed me these wreaths, this concept, I'm like, I like that concept a lot, but we have to have the paper garland that all of us made in elementary school. So, but you have to make it out of waterproof paper because you know in the conservatories, there's water that drips down occasionally. So she made these beautiful, fun paper garlands that are actually waterproof. And then there'll be big hanging um, Christmas cactus in there as well. So that takes you right into the Oval Basin in our East Conservatory. And this is where you get that beautiful long view. So we wanted this to be in very traditional colors. So it's red and green. At the North door, we wanted to make sure you had a great photo op. So here we have two trees that are lightly flocked and they're done in this, this color of lights. And then the center tree is actually a flat panel that's made out of palm fronds that have been cut in different shapes and applied to the panel behind them. And then we uplift the wall to give a nice wash there. The east tree, this is a large tree that divides the patio of oranges. So it's one of our biggest trees under glass. And what I like here is the entire tree is done with nothing but round ornaments. So, and it's all red and green. So we limited the color palette and we, we kept it just to very traditional colors. And then they made these little trees at the base to sort of pick up on that theme as well. 
So the tree is quite stately there. It's nice because you can approach it from both sides. And it also has a canopy of warm white lights that hang above it, making the whole space really quite magical. Another thing right next to it, um, I wanted to have a really fun tree that was done sort of reminiscent of a candy cane. So there's a tree right outside of the ballroom that has a um, tree that's entirely done in red and white ribbon and ornaments. And some of the kids will like, they'll definitely identify it as the candy cane tree. In our ballroom, as many of you know, over the years, we've worked with various school groups to do community trees in there. This year, we reached out to community groups in our local community to do these trees. So seven different groups um, stepped up and they did the ornaments. So what we do is we provide the tree and the lights, and then we do ornaments on the inside of it. And then we ask them to provide 300 handmade ornaments. And then we decorate their trees. Also, these groups get to come back and see the trees. So the most interesting part about this whole exhibit this year was those seven trees are surrounded by a forest of 20 other trees. So when you walk in the ballroom for the first time, you're gonna actually feel like you're walking into a forest. So the organ's still in there and the organ will play intermittently throughout the Christmas season, but the whole experience of the room is really immersive about this forest. And then you get to see the community trees up close and personal. In the exhibition hall, we did a tree on either side. Um, it's kind of interesting. You do a Photoshop, which you can see there on the left-hand side, and this is the real tree on the right-hand side, and you can see how they look so, so similar. So this project leader came to me and said, I really like to make stained glass. And she goes, I will make stained glass ornaments for my tree. And I'm like, that's amazing. So if you look closely at the tree on the right-hand side, you'll see that there are stained glass ornaments in there. They're all handmade. So I've seen Christmas here for 25 years. I've never seen a Christmas where so many project leaders have made handmade ornaments for their trees. So two lovely trees flanking the fern floor on either side. And it wouldn't be a retro theme without the bubble lights. So we brought back the bubble lights. So I think the big thing about this season is there's something that everyone's gonna recognize from their childhood, something they've seen on their parents' trees or their grandparents' trees. So th this year has a very nostalgic feel to it. Also too, the market is really responsive. There's lots of retro things that are back on the market. So it was very easy to find materials to do this with. The center walk tree, this is the second year we've put a large tree in the middle of the center walk. So it's 18 feet tall. That's the biggest tree that tree stand will hold. And it's done in very traditional ornaments. And we also did it in a unique way in that the tree at the top has a little lighter decorations and the ornaments get heavier and bigger as you go down the tree. So it's right there, it does revolve. And of course the whole center walk is a sea of beautiful red poinsettias grown in house. And then this tree takes center stage right in the middle of the conservatory. The exhibition hall, always a favorite spot, a great photo op. The idea here was to create a Main Street America, but back in time. So it had the garland you see there in the center is actually the pattern in the garland that goes across the fern floor. So many of you may, may remember from small towns used to buy these things and put them across their main streets to decorate for the holiday season. Well, our lighting company bought a company that actually had the plans for these types of tinsel decorations. So we bought six of them and they span the fern floor. Now the ones we have don't have bells on them. They have a star in the middle, but it is that pattern and they look beautiful and they draw your eye up. And then we have lit trees and we have sidewalks and we have a beautiful fountain at the end. So when you stand under the clock in the, in the conservatory and you look down the fern floor, it does look like you're looking down Main Street America, but back in time. And there you have it. So it came together beautifully. It looks gorgeous day or night. Um, and I think it really takes people back in time. We also have two beautiful trees at the end. So two large stately trees that are decorated and anchor the space on the stage and the music room. So the music room, when we set the music room up, we wanted it to be a, a mid-century modern holiday party. So it is a retro party when you go in there in the room. Uh, the furniture is pink and mint green. Um, 
really fun things in there. We also had an amazing bar created by our carpentry shop. And here you see it. So this octagon bar really sets the tone. We also worked with two really good glass studios to have all the glassware custom made. So it was made just for this exhibit. One of the studios was Goggle Works in Reading, and they made all the barware, including a custom made punch bowl that has our long rosette etched in it. And then another studio we worked with was Burning Branch out of Kirkwood, PA, and she did all of our art deco glass in the room. So here are the two studios, beautiful work from both of them. Um, we always try to find an artist in this space to sort of elevate it and tell their story. So um, really fun that they got to contribute to our Christmas display. The PBX is also decorated out for the holidays. That's that room right after the ballroom, right after the music room. And the new thing in there was a candle tree. There's a version on the lower right-hand corner, but that was something new that I've not seen before. So our in-house metal shop fabricated a candle tree and it has all battery powered candles on it. Really, really nice, it helps set the tone. This was something really fun. The inspiration was a picture in the upper right-hand corner there where we wanted to have lots and lots of ornaments that people could walk under. So what we did in our Acacia Passage, we took the entire passageway and we hung over 2,000 shatterproof ornaments above your head in this whole rainbow of colors. Um, and then to lower the ceiling, we also added these birch trees in there. So there's birch trees with the urns and all of these amazing ornaments that you get to walk under, hung at varying heights with different rings and strings and um, fishing line. So a really fun experience, really a beautiful space. In the orchid room, we created an orchid chandelier. So some of these pictures aren't finished. You'll just have to come and see it in person. But this is all done with white phalaenopsis, um, white corded lights, and crystals. So it's quite, quite large, and it hangs in the center of the room um, and really sets a tone for that beautiful space with all the orchids around it in full bloom. The Silver Garden, um, it has a really pretty purple tree in it. So it's done in Kokodama, which is where you take a plant, you unpot it, you cover its roots with, with moss, and then you wrap string around it, and that way it keeps the plant alive. So we use that as one of the decorations on the tree, as well as the purple um, ornaments in there with it. Now, here's a fun one. The wildlife tree is always a crowd favorite. So the idea here was to make the bird feeders out of Legos. So we asked the community to do donate their unwanted Legos, and they did. So we got lots of Legos donated, and then we created these bird feeders with them. So the birds, they will be filled daily with seed, and the birds can come right, eat, right up and eat out of these really festive looking houses. Now I will tell you, with the Legos, it, they were pretty heavy. So each one of these birdhouses has its own shepherd's hook in the tree to hold the birdhouse up. Something else fun, everybody remembers these blocks from their childhood. So we took the, the blocks themselves and used them on the tree as decorations on all the tips. But then we had our carpenters make us supersized blocks that we spelled out long with. And we put them here, they're all fixed together so they can't move. Um, and it's another spot for guests to take pictures. So we fully encourage guests to sit on the blocks, a small child to stand on top of them, um, and you can have your picture taken. So they're all there for our guests to enjoy. It was just a nice way to spell out Longwood and keep with the retro theme. Speaking of retro themes, the house of course is decked out for the holiday. Um, under the staircase, you'll see lots of vintage gifts that you would have gotten at the time. Lincoln logs, Tinker Toys, the tricycle, the rocking horse, and of course, a beautiful tree in the center of the house. And all the rooms in the house are open and decorated for the season. And this season would not be complete without a red truck. So I wanted a red truck from the minute we started talking about this project. So one of my coworkers on a side job said, I think I found your truck. And we went and looked at it and it was gray at the time and in pretty rough shape. But I'm like, okay, I think we can make this work. So we brought the tree back to truck back to Longwood and our facilities department, they really love re rehabbing trucks. They all have vintage trucks they've worked on. So they took this project to heart and they remade this entire truck. So um, on the right, you can see it getting its letters put on it. So that is a woman named Hot Rod Jen. And this is her work to do this type of stenciling on vehicles. Um, I originally thought we were gonna just put a vinyl on there, 
until I was told that vinyl was not around in 1969 when this truck was made and that I had to get Hot Rod Jen to come and do the lettering for us. So she's doing Longwood Farms there, established 1906. And the truck is parked right outside the Pierce DuPont house. So guests can walk right up to it and get their picture taken with it. The bed of the truck is 14 feet long. So it's got some nice big Christmas trees in the back of it. And it's also made out of reclaimed white ash from Longwood property. So the, the, the truck has really found a special place at Longwood. All of the tree houses are open and decorated. Each one has a different theme. So in the Canopy Cathedral, we featured paper and lots of hanging ornaments in the center of that space. The Canopy Cathedral also has a great view out over the lake. In the bird house, we have this beautiful arch thing to draw you up there with the red and the gold. All of those gold ornaments were handmade. And as you go up the house, there's more decorations when you climb the staircase. The lookout loft, this was fun. They learned how to do macrame because macrame was very popular back in the vintage period. So they wanted to make macrame for their garland. Of course, the trains are back and running and all decked out for the season. I even saw there's a car that has a little red truck on it. So you will see the red truck appearing quite a bit. As you know, half of the experience is outdoors. So we always encourage people to dress for the weather because you don't want to miss the Christmas lights outside. So this is in the Rose Arbor. This is the form we made last year and we brought it back. It was so popular, we, re we returned it. Um, and I think it's really fun to play with the shadows that this projects on the space. Down the drive, we did this whole beautiful sort of ribbon effect of lights to carry you all the way down the drive. And that takes you right to our first fun thing down here. These lights are as big as the guy standing next to us. They are six feet tall. Remember these lights from your childhood that we get all tangled up? These are also the same lights that used to get so hot you couldn't touch them and they would burn the tree needles. Well, now they're LED, so they don't produce heat and they're much easier to work with, but they also made them supersized. So we took a whole bunch of them and put them together and made like a little floating island of them out there in the lake. The other thing we did was we made these supersized stars. So they're tumbling down the landscape in a large lake. So the biggest one is actually 17 feet across. The smallest one's 14 and there's five of them. So they really light up the landscape and I think they're quite beautiful. Made in house by our metal shop. In the Italian water garden, we did a luminary display. So these are um, luminaries that are not flames inside of them. It's an electric bulb inside of them. But we did a tree in the center and a pattern down both sides of it to animate that space. Our metal tunnel, metal tunnel has returned. We know that's a crowd favorite. So it does have retro programming to go with it. And the one in the main fountain garden is back as well too. So two really fun tunnel experiences. And you'll notice that they're different from, from last year. Our main fountain garden is all lit up for the season. So we encourage guests to go and walk through the main fountain garden. You'll see all of these lit tree forms. And when you get to the end, you'll notice that we did all of these different orbs that light up and change color. This year they're blue and white and they go across the grass and into the water and up the tree. So that is our largest cut tree outside at, at 30 feet tall, and it is in the water at the pear-shaped basin. Fire pits, we have two fire pits this year. Normally we would have had three, but we had to move the one from the Pierce Dupont house in order to make room for the truck. So I think it was worth doing. So now there's one at the Italian Water Garden and one at Pump House Plaza. And they're on every day, weather permitting. Of course, the open air theater is open and running. Now this is weather permitting as well. If it gets below freezing, we can't run the fountains, but as long as it stays above freezing, the fountains run um, at those times posted there. Now, the one question I always get is, where do you get all these ornaments and how many ornaments do you have and what happens to them? So every year we add to the collection. So currently we're at about 67,000 ornaments in 600 styles. Um, this year we used about 20,000 ornaments and we've added probably about two to 3,000 to the collection. Um, some years we add more than others. This year, with it being a retro theme, it called for a lot of new ornaments. So um, I do like shopping for ornaments. And so this year we've bought quite a few new ones. 
Um, also, of course, we cannot forget the horticulture. We've got these beautiful conservatories. So it takes about 18,000 seasonal crops to do the entire display. And out of that, there's over 6,000 just poinsettias alone. This year, we decorated 63 trees, the tallest one being 30 feet. And of course, it takes more than 200 dedicating creative staff, students, and volunteers to bring this to life. So I have the good fortune of being the head elf, but I know um, it would not be the Christmas display without all the dedicated hands to help bring it all to life. Now, I just want to tell you about two floral design classes that are coming up. Um, there's the flower of the month, which is the poinsettia. That's an in-person one. Um, here are the details about it. And a second one, Oh Christmas Tree. So this is an online one. Um, and here are the details about this one. So if you have any more questions about this, of course, the information will be on the website. But, you know, we do have an active CE department. And um, I teach a lot of classes in there. And it's, it's really fun to have, have the outreach to the community through the classes. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to give you some tips on visiting during a Longwood Christmas. Thank you so much, Jim. Well, we look forward to welcome you to the gardens this holiday season. Jim, if you can advance the next slide. Member reservations are required daily from open to close during Longwood Christmas, except regarding premium members and innovators. Visit early in the season as sellouts are likely, especially during the weekends and the week between Christmas and New Year's Day. Member reservations can be made online at longwoodgardens.org. You will see our gardens admission availability. Jim, could we advance the slide? And here's an image of that, <laughs> um, which will provide an at a glance admission availability for the next several weeks when you scroll to the right. The key to our gardens admission availability calendar is directly underneath the heading. So anything shown in blue is available and is an active link to make member reservations. Any times uh, in red is limited, but still an active link. And anything with a strike through is sold out. Reservations can be made every half hour from 10 a.m. until 9.30 p.m. Please note you may enter up to 30 minutes before or after your scheduled time. However, not before we open at 10 a.m. Next slide, Jim. If you would like to bring friends and use your complimentary kit, uh, guest tickets this Christmas season, please be aware these tickets are not accepted on blackout dates during a Longwood Christmas. Blackout dates are all Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays during a Longwood Christmas through January 1st, as well as every day from December 22nd through January 1st. Our homepage also shows when complimentary guest tickets are accepted and when they are not. Next slide. And now your questions. Okay, Jim, we have quite a few set of questions. Okay, the first question is, um, a, a person remembers about 10 years ago, we had an incredible display on the fern floor. That is where all the water is, of course, in the middle of the conservatory that remembers a long grand dining room table. And instead of chairs, it looked like it was ready for Christmas dinner. Um, they really enjoyed that display. And they were wondering, have you ever thought about bringing that back again? Um, we have thought about it. I remember that table setting very well. Um, it is fun to do, um, and everybody imagines them, themselves sitting at that big table. So a lot of times it has to do with the theme and whether that particular set would go to the theme. So I have the theme for the last 30 years, and I can say we've only repeated one of them. So um, we would think about the table setting. We have done smaller tables in the music room, but yeah, the table setting is something that we certainly keep that one in our, our bag of tricks. Wonderful. Next question. So uh, 2024 will be the very first time a Longwood Christmas will include our new West Conservatory space. Have you started thinking about how to incorporate that space or have you even confirmed what the theme is going to be for 2024? 
Um, as a matter of fact, I have. So it was very unusual. Last year, I had three strong themes and I presented all three at the same time and I got all three approved. So I actually have themes for the next two years. Now, I cannot tell you those themes um, because I work very closely with our marketing department and they're like, do not let the theme out until we're ready to release it. So um, right now the theme is a working title, but we do have a theme. It does include the new spaces and long reimagined. And um, we are definitely working with that whole concept um, to include that space as well for the Christmas season. Wonderful. We had a question about your yearly budget to produce along with Christmas. Could you share a little bit about that? You mentioned about this year that you purchased 2000 ornaments, but of course there's lights and things like that. Does it fluctuate a lot throughout the years? Um, no, we pretty much have a set budget. It's a generous budget. Um, the, without getting into the, the details of it, but we allocate a set amount for trees. We allocate a set amount for the outdoor lights because the outdoor lights are a big investment. And then we allocate a, almost an equal amount for the rest of the Christmas projects. So, um, and then that money is taken and divided up amongst the project leaders. And they each, depending on the size of their project, have a set amount of money to spend. Um, now, truth be told, at the end of the day, there is a, a slush fund, so to speak, that I call Christmas supplies, and I'm in charge of Christmas supplies. So while I put myself at the bottom of the picking order for ornaments, I also give myself the biggest budget, but I share that with all the project leaders as need be. And we do always manage to bring Christmas in on budget. Wonderful. You spoke a little bit about uh, the lights, the LED lights uh, for outside. Could you share a little bit about uh, the cadence of how how many years we get out of a set of lights and things like that? Sure. So with our LED lights, you remember the old incandescent lights. We put them on and at the end of the season, they were pretty much done because we, we burned them for so many hours. With the LED lights, from the minute they show up on the property, we write the date on the plug. And that way we know from that point in time, we're going to get roughly five years out of those lights. So while they are more of an investment initially, the five years is a great return on them. So, um, we date the plugs so that way we know if a strand is getting tired or not, or if we have to replace them. Now, the one thing you have to be very careful of is the whites are different shades of white from year to year. So for example, if you're gonna do a whole space in warm white, you have to make sure that all those warm whites are the same year because the, the quality is a little different from year to year and the way they make them um, is different too. So the other thing that will surprise you about LEDs is that the cost is different depending on the color. So we know that certain colors will cost more to do. That doesn't stop us from using them. It's just a good thing to know. And then we've also, over the years, built a really close relationship with a lighting vendor who has all the manufacturing in China as well. So we'll get custom blends and we'll get a lot of trial lights and specialty things, which I think elevate our display. Wonderful. Any new sets of lights because of you were trying to bring that retro feel into our spaces? Sure, the giant bulbs on the lake were totally new just for this year. And also the um, lit tinsel garlands above the fern floor, they are all done with LED lights and they are all brand new just for this theme, um, as are the bubble lights. You know, we bought bubble lights enough just to do two trees, so they're new to the collection. There wasn't a new color this year, but there were certainly new lighting techniques. And we also used a lot of the bigger bulbs. We call them C7s and C9s. So they're the ones you remember that used to be the screw-in type of bulbs. Um, they now come in LEDs. So you'll see there's used throughout the display. Um, a lot of people, when they thought of retro, they immediately thought of those bigger, larger Christmas bulbs. Wonderful. We have several questions about the music room and the custom bar that you spoke of. Uh, people are interested in what that furniture um, is going to be repurposed or any thoughts about that? Sure. So the bar was custom made by our carpenters in-house. So it is just a prop. So it will be taken apart. It's a beautiful prop, but it is a prop. And we will, we will reclaim some of that wood and reuse what we can of it. So the bar will come apart. Um, the furniture that's in the room, we will probably save that as well as we will save all the glassware. So we do save these props and, and safeguard them and use them again in future years. So you won't see it used again immediately, but a couple of years down the road, you may see a piece or two of it. And then um, eventually it, it will have served its purpose. 
but we do try to reuse and repurpose things as much as we possibly can. Wonderful. So uh, we received a question about the Lego blocks and the bird feeders. Could you share a little bit about how they were secured and, and how those bird feeders are together? Sure. So I'll start first with the bird feeders. So we um, built them out of Lego blocks as many children would have built, but you just have to make sure you have openings for them and spots for the birds to get in and get the seed. And then there was an um, adhesive that I'm not, I didn't make them. So I'm not 100% sure of the adhesive, but I know there was an adhesive put over top of them because otherwise they wouldn't withstand the weather. So there was a, a glue put on them to seal them all together so that they don't fall apart while the birds are on them. And then because of the weight of them, each one had to have its own shepherd's hook to hold it up and support it. You can't just hang them in the tree by themselves. They're much too heavy. And especially with the seed inside of them. So that's how they were fabricated. Um, it is something that we found online. So I'm sure that the instructions are out there somewhere to do that one. When it came to the blocks, that was a total original idea. I'm like, we gotta have blocks. Everybody had blocks from their childhood. So we got the little tiny blocks and we put little screw eyes in the corner of them. And then we put a real light varnish over top of the blocks just to keep them looking nice during the holiday season. And then the big blocks, we had our carpenters make us the blocks. And then we had someone cut out the letters so we could spell out Longwood. And we wanted that dimension so it actually looked like the little blocks that are on the tree. Wonderful. We have a question about uh, what inspired the grapefruit trees in the conservatory. Ah, interesting question. Actually, technically that space would be called an orangery because at the turn of the century, if you had a conservatory that big, you always grew citrus because citrus were prized out of season. They weren't shipping them around the globe like they do today. So you always had citrus in there of some kind. Now, for years, we did grow tangelos out there on the lawn. We had a set of three tangelos out there. The only problem with the tangelos is that they ripen at Christmas time and the orange clashed with all of our red poinsettias. So we had to pick every single fruit off the trees when they were done. So we decided let's switch to some other fruit. So I wanted lemons. Um, we weren't able to get the lemon trees. So we went with grapefruit. So they are Oro Blanco grapefruit. While I'm not a fan of grapefruit as a fruit, um, they do make a very nice display. They fruit quite heavily and we're able to harvest that fruit and work with Victory, a local brewing company, and use it to flavor a Pilsner. So the grapefruits do have a purpose, um, and there's a reason that we always have citrus on the lawn, uh, and they also don't clash with the poinsettias. Very important notes. <laughs> yeah, very, very important. <laughs> we had a question about why is the room called PBX? Oh, the little space there's called the PBX because um, well before cell phones and well before everybody had a phone at their desk, there was a central trunk line that came in and we had an operator that sat back there and she took every call and through a switchboard, sent it out to the various people. So if you've ever wondered, there's a restrooms in there and that little tiny box there, that's where the PBX operator sat for decades, um, taking all of Longwood's calls and seeing that they got rooted the right direction. So the name is stuck, even though the position is long gone. Wonderful. We had a question about the truck. Um, do you envision for that truck to be out and about and through the gardens? Um, we're not sure what's going to, we, we know we're going to keep the truck. Originally, the idea with the truck was that it was just going to be a prop. We were just going to paint it red, tow it on place and, you know, hope for the best. But our facilities guys took it a whole different direction and they made it just a beautiful, beautiful truck. So my role in it was to pay for the original truck and I did pick the color. So that red you see on it is called red line red, like in your old speedometers when they used to tack out in red, that's what red line red means. So I picked the color, I paid for the truck, um, but the facilities guys are the really the ones who put all the sweat equity into it and did all the other work on the truck. So we are gonna keep the truck. It is now the first official vehicle in the Longwood fleet of vehicles. That's why it says H1 on it meaning it's a horticulture vehicle and it's the first one. So I imagine you're gonna see this truck um, through the years doing some other things. We don't know what yet, but it's been so well received. And if you've been out shopping, you can't help but notice the red truck is everywhere. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because usually we don't respond to the market, but I like to say the market responded to us. You know, you'll see the truck on stationary, on napkins, on pillows, 
on handbags. We have it for sale in the shop. Um, so the, the the truck is everywhere, and I think it's going to become part of Longwood for the foreseeable future. I think so too. And it does drive. I mean, it is fully. It's it's you know we're going to have historical plates put on it, but it drove into the garden under its own steam. So that was quite a moment too. But you you can see from that one picture, the truck was entirely taken apart, like entirely apart. I was worried it wasn't going to go back together, but they assured me that it would, and it did. And they did a um, and another amazing part about it, the front bumper, when they took it off, they didn't like it. So our metal shop made a whole new bumper for it, including turning the stainless steel washers for it. So, I mean, the, the truck is is a custom one of a kind now. And guests need to check out the license plate. Yep. <laughs> Wonderful. We had a question about sustainability and how it's woven into this incredible display. Would you like to highlight that a little bit? Sure. So, um, we compost all of our plant material. So all of our plant material stays on site and goes into our compost stream. So that's one thing we do. Um, we also repurpose and reuse quite a bit. As I mentioned, we, we save all our own ornaments. We have them all cataloged and inventoried. So we know what we have and we do use them um, every year. We go through the collection and we, we pull up the ornaments we use. If an ornament, the number becomes too small or something unusable, we do donate ornaments to other organizations too, and other things from Christmas that we no longer need. So we do find organizations to donate things to as well. So it's a whole series of all those things, but we do think about those things when we think about everything that we're doing for our holiday display. You talked quite a bit about the timing of your themes and how you already have a few years out, but when do you start really purchasing all of those kinds of supplies? How much lead out time do you need? We generally start heavy purchasing in um, February, March, April. And then because remember, everybody that has a Christmas project is actually a gardener. So they're busy gardening. So there's not a lot of Christmas that gets done in May and June. It picks up a little bit again in July. They do it on rainy days. And there's a little push at the end to buy things. But generally, we have so much stuff in stock that we can use a lot of that. Um, and the purchasing kind of comes in spring before the spring push, and then in early fall to get everything in. Wonderful. We had a question about indoor trees and their care. How do you take great care of our cut trees and prevent them from drying out? Well, the first thing we do is that our trees are fresh cut. And by fresh cut, I mean, they're usually cut the day before they arrive to us. So they don't sit on the tree lot. They're not trucked long distances. Um, it's one of the few things we won't tell you where the trees come from. Um, and that is because we are trying to preserve those spaces um, for our bigger trees. So we're in competition for big trees. So that is one of the few things at Longwood, other than I can't tell you the theme ahead of time, I also can't tell you where we get our trees from. But from the minute the tree shows up on the property, it is always kept in water. So we just keep them in clean water you don't need to put aspirin in the water. You don't need to put gin in the water. You don't need to put anything in the water, just a clean cut on the bottom of the tree and don't let the tree dry out. So that's the main secret that we've done for decades and really helps it with our tree. Make sure it's a fresh, clean cut and don't let it dry out. Could you share a tip if there, what you do when you have a tree that has a bare spot or a broken branch that's in a pivotal location of a tree? Yeah, there are things we do that the average homeowner probably would not do. Um, if a tree were to have a big hole in it, we will actually drill into the trunk and stick a new branch in there. Now, mind you, that branch does not last the entire time. So the project leader has to know where that branch is because we will have to replace it midway through. So that's the worst case scenario. Uh, worst case scenario is we drill and implant a new branch. Um, most of the time we can just turn it to the best side is facing forward like we all do with our trees and our houses. Um, or we will also wire one branch to another to pull it down, to make it look that, you know, to try to fill that gap. And also just the other tree decorating technique is you'll notice on our trees, we don't like them super dense. We like them to have an open format because you want to put big ornaments on the inside and then work your way out with smaller ones to get the tip. And then we actually use, use little things we call tippers on the very tips of them. So we find that an open structure of the tree lends itself to more um, decorating options. 
Would you share a little bit of our tips of how to um, wind lights on the branches of the trees? <laughs> Um, well, if you want to become a longwood tree lighter, you actually have to sit and watch a video on lighting trees. Um, and then your tree has to pass the squint test. And the squint test is when somebody looks at your tree and squints their eyes, they have to make sure they don't see any dark spots. So we um, go, we take the, the lights, we go up through the trunk of the tree up to the top of the tree and start lighting from the top to the bottom. Because when you get to the bottom, if you have extra lights, it's easier to hide the extra lights in the bottom of the tree. If you get to the top of the tree and you have extra lights, there's not too much to do with them. So always run the cord all the way up through the tree, start at the top, and then we wrap each branch and we try not to do that thing where you pull one branch to the other. We definitely do not want the cord showing. So we try to go up and down a branch. Um, and if you have to, you can untwist them a little bit and poke a branch through them. Wonderful. We did have a question. Do we have any silver trees, like a, a tinsel silver oh. tree that has the rotating color wheel beneath it that shows up through? We looked at that one. We opted not to do the color wheel tree, but we do have a eight foot tinsel tree in the music room. So the music room has, for the first time, has three trees in it. And one of them, two of them are live cut trees but one of them is an entirely silver tinsel tree. So we knew we had to have a tinsel tree, but we did um, decide to opt out of the rotating color wheel tree. Um, we thought that might be a little bit much, but um, the tinsel tree I think is very cool. So um, if there's something you can think of for your childhood, chances are we thought of it too and tried to incorporate it. Wonderful. We did get a question about uh, what is the one thing that you did repeat in your time here? Yeah, we repeated one on trees. So before we had trees of the world, and then I did um, trees reimagined or something like that. I forget how we marketed it, but we actually did repeat a tree theme twice where, where trees were actually part of the title. So that's the only one we, we've repeated. And those of you who are members through the years, you know, our themes are very distinct. You know, we've had gingerbread, we've had birds, we've had water, we've had, you know, all kinds of unique themes. So that's another thing that made this year such a strong theme was that it stuck out so much from anything else we've done. I think so. We have a question about the ornaments that are made by the community groups. Are they returned to the community groups or are they a part of Longwood's collection? Um, if you make ornaments for us, for our community things, we return them all to you. So because they were new groups we've not reached out to before, before when working with the school groups, they all had art programs and art instructors. So this was a different thing because they don't necessarily have an art program or an art instructor. So we made them samples of ornaments um, and we either gave them a stipend or we gave them the materials to actually make the ornaments. So all the kids make the ornaments, we put them on the tree, they get past it to come and see their trees. And then at the end, we take all the ornaments down and we give them back to them. So they can give them back to the kids that made them and they can enjoy them for future years on their own trees. We have a question about the trees again, our fresh cut trees. Are they from local nurseries or local farms? Again, I'm not gonna tell you any more than they come from the state of Pennsylvania. <laughs> so um, the, that's, the, that's the closest we're gonna to get to where our trees come from, but we do buy them from local um, sources and they're all within the state of Pennsylvania. Wonderful. We have a question. You've inspired people to potentially become a Longwood volunteer for Christmas. Um, could you share a little bit about that? Well, the volunteers are a very integral part of it. Um, most of the volunteers are actually volunteers throughout the year. There's very few that come just for Christmas that I'm aware of, but um, these are volunteers that work with the gardeners and part of working with the gardeners is helping them on their Christmas project. So that's how a lot of them have gotten in the system and um, help us with our display. Wonderful. There's a question about custom fabrication items. Um, could you share a little bit where some of these items are stored and where uh, maybe where do we mock up some of these grand scale displays as well? Sure, our facilities department are a very talented group of fabricators. Um, some of the things get so big they have to just make them outside. So we go outside and look at them. Um, and then we store some of them outside, like the metal pieces we'll store outside. Um, and some of those things don't require any kind of special storage. But we are fortunate that we have a big barn 
and we can use the top floor of that. We need to do big scale mock-ups. Um, but a lot of these things come back apart and are either stored that way or repurposed from that way. We had a question about outdoor lights. Do they all come down during Christmas? So everything that is in our in our uh, live trees and shrubs. Um, I would say 90% of the lights come down. There are a few occasions where we can leave them on the upper branches of a tree, only provided that the tree doesn't grow a whole lot during the season. But any lights the guests could see would come down. So we do take the majority of lights off all of the trees. We don't leave them up there for years. Um, and we can only leave them up on certain varieties of trees. And that's only for the following year. And they have to come down again. So we don't do anything that would ever damage the trees. Wonderful. Um, have you ever lent lights or um, other materials to other organizations, charitable events and, and uh, community groups? Generally not the lights because they are um, an electrical thing and there probably would be some liability associated with that. So the lights we have, we all use internally. Um, but as I mentioned, we have made donations to other organizations of non-electrical things that would not, you know, could not cause any any potential hazards. Where do you look for inspiration? Um, are there sp special social media sites or organizations or maybe even retail companies that you're always checking out for ideas? Everywhere. So there are so many ideas. We are inundated with images. So people constantly send me ideas and images. I follow certain ones. I don't have a favorite one um, because you never know where the idea is gonna come from. So when people ask me that question, I generally say, if someone tells you they have a brand new idea, be very suspicious. Um, because we've been around so long, there are so many images at our fingertips that you may have a new twist on an idea, but chances are if you peel that idea back enough to its kernel, you're gonna find that it came from somewhere else or was influenced by something else. That's not to say it's good or bad. I mean, we actually have people that come here and tell us they're, they're here to steal ideas. And we're like, that's fine. And then if they have something good, we'll go and steal the idea from them. So um, there's nothing really off limits. I mean, we don't wanna flat out copy somebody else, but we will certainly go and look at it. And then we'll say, oh, what can we do with that? And then also our vendors, we also respond to what's on the market. And you know, new technology, especially within the lighting world. I mean, there's there's so many advances in lighting. So we rely very heavily on the vendors to tell us what's new and what people are using. Wonderful. We had a question about scent and smell through the exhibit. Has that been a, a thought of how to incorporate that into the display? Um, in certain years, yes, it certainly has been. Um, for those of you who are here for the the gingerbread theme. When you walked in the music room, it smelled like gingerbread and it had nothing to do with the gingerbread cookies that were in there. It was a little scent machine. So you can actually have a scent machine. It's a small device that has little scent packets and a little blower fan and it'll scent the entire room. So we do think of scents. We do use scents occasionally. Um, a lot of times you would just smell the scent of the trees. Like when you go in the, in the ballroom, you're going to smell all 27 of those trees. It's going to smell like a forest because of all the trees in there. But um, we, we do use scent occasionally. And then also there are natural scents. You know, we use paper whites. Um, we use big white lilies, um, Asiatic lilies, because they have a great smell. So um, we do let the plant smells come through too once in a while. But yeah, once in a while, if it's appropriate, we do in introduce a scent. Wonderful. We had a question about poinsettia trees and training them. Could you share a little bit about that? Sure. We do have some poinsettia standards, those trees. Um, Poinsettias, as you know, are native to Mexico and they grow to huge shrubs. So there's a variety, an old variety, I think it's called Missouri, but it's an old cultivar of poinsettia, but it makes a huge, huge thick trunk. So we grow that up as our trunk and then we graft the other ones to the top of it. So grafting is where you take and make little cuts in it and you put the desired plant in there and they heal together, but they have to be the same plant or very closely related. So the poinsettia standards are grafted and that's how you make the nice big head on it but it is all poinsettias. It's just one that happens to have a very strong trunk and get tall, and then another one that you want for the head. So that's how we make the poinsettia standards. Now they're only good for a year or two. So ours, we only use them for one year, and then they go to compost because we already started the ones for the next year. 
So we had a question about other spots and are they decorated? Like the um, the green wall bathrooms in the conservatory, the cafe spaces, the Isle of Water, Tilbury Garden, Children's Garden. Could you share a little bit about those kind of spaces? Sure. Um, we do try to put a nod to Christmas everywhere we can. So all the restrooms always get a beautiful plant, usually it's an orchid, um, to decorate them for the holiday season. We do put a light touch of decorations in the children's garden. Um, spaces that are generally not open um, in the fall and winter, like the Eye of Water, for example, we don't decorate it because nobody's ever up there really to see it. Um, so we do have a Christmas route and we have a Christmas map that you can get in the visitor center that'll point out all the key highlighted spots. And along that whole route, you'll see that pretty much the hand of Christmas has touched all of them. So that includes every room in the Terrace restaurant. We do decorate it for the season. Wonderful. We have a lot of admirers of the red truck. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise. Could you say uh, tell us about the make in the year? Um, we have thoughts about it should be used in parades, maybe <laughs> a photo album of how it was restored. I mean, there's lots of love about this red truck. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that because I love the red truck too. Um, the red truck is very cool. There will be a blog post about it. We did film um, Hot Rod Jen putting the letters on it and doing the, the stenciling on it. Um, and we've all been interviewed, all of us to help with the truck. So I believe they are putting something together about that. So our marketing will release that. Um, so there will be lots of stories to be told about the red truck. So yeah, we did document its progress all along. So you'll see it from when it was just showed up and when pretty rough shape to what it is today. So um, yeah, more to come on that one. But yes, we definitely are gonna capitalize on the red truck and um, there'll be many stories told about it, as well as probably hundreds of thousands of Christmas cards that will feature the red truck. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'll tell you, it's a it's a 1969 International Loadster truck. Um, I don't know trucks, so I don't know a whole lot more than that about it. Um, I, that's really all I know. So, um, you know, it's a manual transmission. It's an old style truck. Um, it, the farmer had added things to it through the years, like a corn auger and other things like that. Anything that was added to the truck, we took off. So the truck is now back to its original state and condition with no add-ons. Was the inside touched at all or was that kept originally from the farm? Again, when I thought it was just gonna be a prop, I was going to put just a plaid blanket over the two torn seats on the inside of it. And our facilities department told me that was not acceptable and they were going to have it reupholstered. So the inside of the truck, the seats have been reupholstered in black, so they look very nice. And something you won't be able to see, but um, kind of a cool nod to everybody that's involved in the truck. All of us that are part in the truck got to sign the inside passenger door. So our names are recorded in history on the inside of the truck. How oh, lovely. <laughs> we had quite a few questions about the LED lights and power savings compared to old-fashioned lights. Could you share a little bit about that? Phenomenal power savings. So we used to trip circuits with the old lights, mm -hmm. and you had to be very careful how many strands you put together. You know, I think it was like maybe five strands. Now with the LEDs, I think you could put together up to like 20 strands, and the power they take is a fraction of it. So we're no longer tripping circuits. And also with LEDs, you can have regular line voltage, or you can have low voltage. So the low voltage ones makes it so that we can use them close to water. So because they'll 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 trip and they don't use as much current. So um, the lighting technology has enabled us to do a lot of lighting. And also too, when you see our trees uplit with these big up lights, those are also things we can control with our phones and change the color of them. So um, technology and lighting um, has come a long way, and it's all very very energy efficient. Wonderful. We had a question about, have we ever thought about extending a Longwood Christmas through January and February? Okay, we have looked at the dates of a Longwood Christmas several times. And what happens is when we go too far into January is the attendance drops off a lot and the plants get really tired. So, um, and then we have to do a full scale Christmas change. So the, uh, the dates we picked for Christmas are when we know the most people are available to see the holiday display and the holiday day display is going to look as fresh as it can possibly look. So we want day one to look as good as the last day. So um, that's why we positioned the way we do. We It did at one point in time go later into January, but um, 
things look really tired. And also too, the trees, even though they were very freshly cut, do drop needles. And some of the trees by the end of this play are just hanging on. So, um, and it's really hard to undecorate a tree and redecorate it. That requires a crew to come in and work through the night. And we, we do do that occasionally because the tree will fail on us, but we don't want to make that a practice. We have done a number of different displays in the middle of the smaller large lake or the pear-shaped basin. Could you share how we run power out to those kinds of floating displays? Sure. Um, I've never actually run the power. <laughs> I have suggested several times, and I believe they put it in a conduit. And those are all always low voltage. So there, there's no real threat to them. So we do use low voltage when we do it in those, those floating displays. But I think it's really cool. I love to see the, the things out there floating and it just makes it very magical. So I think we're gonna continue that. You mentioned in your conversations with the, the ornaments and you mentioned a tipper. Could you describe what a tipper ornament is in a little bit more detail? Sure, tippers to us mean very small ornaments and very light ornaments. They go right on the tip of the branch. So, you know, we like to decorate the whole branch, big, in the, big inside towards the trunk, and then getting smaller as you go out. And when you get to the tip, we use tippers, which are just like they sound, very light little things. They could be icicles. They could be small, small, small crystals ornaments. They could be even those little millimeter balls that come with the wire that you just wire on the tips of the tree. But it's just a way to add yet another element to the very outside of your tree. Would you share how many days does it take from when we uh, close down from um, uh, our last day of autumn seasonal highlights or uh, um, our chrysanthemum festival? I'm sorry, our, our last day of chrysanthemum festival and how long it takes to change over the entire display. Sure. So if you've ever been here the last day of chrysanthemum festival at around five o'clock, you'll see there's all these people coming in. That's all the staff. So they start at six o'clock. As soon as we close the doors on Chrysanthemum Festival, we start that night. So um, we start ripping out the chrysanthemums then and the thousand bloomer goes away. Some of the bigger pieces go away and we bring in the trees. Our goal that night is to get the beds cleared and the trees in. And then we give ourselves four days to get Christmas in. So, um, and by that fourth day, it all needs to be in. And on the fifth day being Friday, we then open up to the public. Wonderful. Well, Jim, we thank you so much for sharing your love, your expertise, and all of your knowledge of a Longwood Christmas, just not this year, but many, many past years. And we look forward to the next one. And to all of you, all of our members who are with us today, thank you so much for your love and your passion of the gardens. You are our best fans, and, uh, and we love that. Please come and see this incredible exhibit. And... Um, Everyone will receive a video link to watch this video again or share it with other loved ones. And we look forward to seeing you very soon in the gardens. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.